Uh, let's start with class first. Now, um, previous lecture, we've talked about what are the applications of uh, plant tissue culture, uh, microbial use for bioprocessing and foods and all that. So now we're going to talk about genetic modification. So previous lecture, we were talking about what are the benefits of it. I have another video on um, the other point of view on genetic modification. So I will show you that video later. But now we're going to look at some concerns. Previously, I said that there's always two sides. There are always two sides of the view, right? Firstly, there will be always those people who think that, OK, we need GM foods to eradicate maybe poverty, to produce cheaper foods so that it can reach a wider base community, especially those who are poorer. And uh, if they were to be eating clay cookies, would they be choosing GM foods instead? But on the other hand, there are also those more, especially those in more developed nations that choose not to have genetically modified foods. So now we're going to look at the basis of those. Why do they not want GM foods? Or maybe you can have your views later why you do not want GM foods. So we're going to look at three types of concerns. There are a lot of concerns, actually. But let's look at just one, one of them. Now, one of them is allergenicity. How many of you are allergic to something? Yes, yeah, interesting. What that gone? Huh? What are you allergy to? Alcohol. Oh, good boy. <laughs> I remember my ex-house roommate. She had allergy to alcohol too. So it was Chinese New Year, and we were just we were just drinking shandy. I think shandy had a very mild alcohol content, very very mild. And she started to develop patch, and we didn't know what that was. So we had to bring her to the doctor. And so the doctor asked, "What's the problem?" We dare not say it was alcohol. Oh, seafood, seafood allergy. And then um, just had a histamine jab, and it was all right. So I'm allergy to, to prawns sometimes. I think it's not the prawns. I think it's uh, maybe something that, that uh, one of the uh, proteins of certain prawns or something. So sometimes you can see my lips being swollen. Now, that being said, some allergies can be prevented if we know that what they are. If I know that I'm allergy to prawns, I can maybe eat less or stop eating certain prawns. Uh, alcohol, for example, don't drink alcohol. But what if we have allergy that we are not aware of? How do we deal with that? Now, this is the uh, issue of allergens that are there, but we are not aware that it's there, and therefore it affects us. So now, as I've mentioned, how come these plant materials uh, can be considered as GM plants. It's because that we are altering its genes. So sometimes we can knock out certain genes, that means we eliminate certain genes, or um, we can add genes inside. Now most of these what we call transgenic plants, or plants that have been genetically modified, they would have at least one gene, sometimes two genes. From my previous lecture, you could have seen those plants that are resistant to um, insects. Uh, with the BT genes. How those plants fare if they have one gene, well, they survive. Two genes, they survive better, right, for example. So in this case, most of the transgenic plants will have at least one to two recombinant DNA. Now, some of these um, genes are being extracted from somewhere else. In this instance, it comes from, um, OK, its genes will express a particular protein. It can be to resist <coughs> virus or to re resist some insects. From our previous example, the BT gene to resist certain insects. So these BT genes uh, is meant for the plant to resist insects. Some resist drought and, and so on. But um, as I've mentioned in my earlier lecture, some plants are also modified so that they can have enhanced nutrient intakes. I hope that you have read about the golden rice and all that. Have you? No? Hmm. OK, now the BT proteins, they save the maize plant from attack by the uh, European corn borer, a type of insect. So as I've mentioned, it's not that they get attacked every day. Sometimes it's seasonal. So if we have the genes inside, then the plants will have two benefits. One, it resists the insect itself. And secondly, because we are spraying insecticides, if the plant already have the ability to resist certain insects, then we don't have to spray so much insecticides, right? So two benefits. Now, this, ha this kind of uh, BT gene may be already present in soil bacteria. So we may have already been consuming that for a very long time. 
When we consume plants, not necessarily we just consume that plant. Most of the time we would consume together soil materials, unawarely. We think that we're washing it clean enough, but we are not. So these can actually uh, be introduced to our diet or our eating habit for a very long period of time. So because of that, uh, people will have contact with them and we will have less problem with uh, allergy. So, some people who are allergy to certain allergens of the GM plants, if we know what are those, that can be done. For example, the genes can be removed prior to maybe um, transportation or delivering to the community for consumption or the com consumer for consumption. So one example is that the gene can be removed or inactivated. Now one example here is one group in Japan that they have removed a major allergen from a variety of rice. So they are aware that those rice can contain allergens and those allergens can affect certain parts of the consumer or con community. They have identified that and they can remove the allergen. But how about allergens that we don't know, we are not aware of, of its presence or existence? How do we remove that? So in re US, research is constantly being done to try to remove allergen from seafood, in this case, shrimps. And a lot of people are also allergy to peanuts. And uh, they're also trying their best to remove allergens. Now, not all allergens can be removed that effectively. So that also poses a problem. Now, I want to give an example of the Brazilian nut um, incident of allergenicity. So what happened is that um, animal feed are uh, constantly made from soya, soybean, or in many instances, the byproduct of the soy processing industry. So we make soy milk, we make tofu. And uh, at the end of the day, what do we do with the soy biomass, the peanuts, uh, soy, soy nuts, soybeans biomass? When we make soy milk, we extracted the milk from the bean. At the end of the day, what happened to the bean residue, the solid residue, what we call okara, okay, okara. So what happens to that? Uh, well, we can throw, but most of the time, we won't throw. We will convert that to animal food, feed, animal feed. So if that's the case, um, how is the nutritional level? Well, that has also been evaluated. If we are feeding our cattle, uh, maybe for the poultry industry also, all these animal feed, they will evaluate nutrient composition. And what they found is that if we get it from soybeans, it lacks of certain amino acid. The sulfur ones, such as cysteine, um, methionine, and things like that, those are the sulfur amino acids. So they are lacking in this sulfur amino acid. But other than that, um, soybean can be a very rich source of protein. But how to improve on that? So one, uh, one example is to introduce a gene that has high in sulfur amino acid, and uh, it comes from this Brazilian nut. So introduce the gene into soybeans. Now the experiment was relatively very successful. The gene has been successfully introduced, and at the end of the day, they find that they found that the amino acid profile has been improved where sulfur amino acids have been increased. But what they do not know, and at that time when they were doing all these um, gene um, transplantation, was that it actually posed as an allergy effect to a lot of consumers. So what they found is that although this variety of soybean is not meant for human consumption, but the possibility of contamination can occur. They mean to feed it to the animals. But what if contamination occurs and somehow all these feed make their way, or the, um, now the transgenic soybean make their way to human consumption? Then we will be attacked with allergy because of the allergen. So because of that, this was not marketed. Although the, uh, the genetic modification was successful, this product was not marketed. So this product was never marketed, so it, there, were, there has been no report of people uh, reporting allergenicity based on the uh, transgenic allergen. So what happens is that, now, when we're developing genetically modified foods, whether we agree or not agree with the concept, a lot of things have to be taken into consideration. One of it is the presence of allergen. Whatever that we introduce the new genetically modified crop or plants, will that affect allergenicity in humans? Um, if, this top, if this thing has been looked beforehand, then the public would not have an issue with that. It would not have been a public debate, all right? So that's one example. 
And another example is gene transfer. Um, I think previously, uh, Zhu Xiang asked about if we are ingesting those genes, what will happen? So pay attention to this part. Now, gene transfer can occur via two, um, two ways. One is the horizontal gene transfer, one is the vertical uh, gene transfer. Now, vertical genes transfer meaning transfer of genes mainly from one generation to another generation. So we have one generation of bacteria, then they regrow and reproduce to the next, and then they produce the next generation of bacteria. So of course, genes will be transferred towards that vertical line to their offsprings. So that's vertical gene transfer. Now, vertical genes transfer normally happen within the same species. Then we have horizontal genes transfer as well. So imagine in our gut, all right, in our gut, in our intestines, we have a lot of bacteria. As a matter of fact, we have more bacteria cells than human cells. And, we, and our whole genome, by the time we sequence our whole genome, if we take consideration of the microbial genome, the microbial genome far exceed our human genome. So taking into consideration of that, we know that our gut has a lot, it's a huge reservoir of microorganisms. Now, if a gene is transferred from one bacteria to another bacteria of a different species, or sometimes possibly a different genus, then that's what we call a horizontal gene transfer. So genes are transferred not by bacteria producing its offspring and passing that gene to its offspring, but passing a certain gene to its neighbor, the bacteria that's surrounding it. Okay, so that's horizontal gene transfer. So I hope that you, you would be uh, conscious about these two of, um, gene transfer mechanisms. Now, gene can also be transferred from uh, pollen between plants of the same or related species in the wild. So we have, um, assuming from the video that we watch from Monsanto, they are planting a lot, they're producing a lot of genetically modified plants, right? But currently they are doing it in an enclosed um, environment, enclosed building, that's what they say, so much secrecy that they are planting it in an enclosed environment. Now assuming that they are planting all these transgenic crops in an open environment. Of course, they can isolate the whole environment, maybe 10 kilometers from that, then they start to plant uh, non-transgenic plants. But is there a possibility, do you think, that some of these gene materials from this transgenic plant can actually be transferred to the plants that are of normal origin? Is there such a possibility? Yes, there is such a possibility. And one of it here is by pollens. So pollens can be brought by wind, pollens can be brought by insects, right? So whatever it is, but genetic materials can be transferred from those genetic genetically modified crops to those normal crops, all right? So transfer, the transfer of disease or pest resistance from cultivated plants can occur to wild species. Now wild species meaning species that, um, that, are, that are already there on its own. It's just like wild patai, wild durian. We have those in the jungle, right? Now what will happen if these genetically modified uh, crops have such a transfer and these transgenes are actually transferred to the wild plants? What will happen? The wild plants ultimately will have resistance to the pests ultimately will have resistance to drought or whatsoever, right? They will acquire those resistance traits. Now, major, a major concern about gene transfer is that it can have illnesses to humans. Now, um, okay, one of these important ones that I want you to take notice about is antibiotic resistance. Do you know what is antibiotic resistance? Now, if we are sick, I am sure many of you may have experienced this. If you're sick, you go see a doctor and they prescribe you antibiotics. One dose of antibiotics and you're still not well. Get you a different antibiotic or the same antibiotic but at higher dosage and you still don't get well. Go for a third time seeing the doctor and give you maybe again the same antibiotic but a higher dose but most probably by the third time the doctor will change your antibiotic. Now all these occur because of antibiotic resistance. We have already been, um, we are already immune or, or, or we have resistance towards that antibiotic. So if a fever is caused by a certain bacteria and that bacteria have this antibiotic resistance, meaning whatever antibiotic that we eat, that particular antibiotic that we eat, 
can no longer kill or inhibit the growth of that bacteria. So we need to change antibiotic, maybe a stronger one, or worse, uh, not worse, similarly terrible. We would have to assume, uh, consume the same antibiotic, but at a higher dose. So how far can we go? Keep on eating antibiotics at a higher dose, higher dose, higher dose, or keep on getting antibiotics that are stronger and stronger? What if one day uh, we have antibiotics that are already at the end of the line, and there's no, no other things to treat us anymore? So anti that happens, that happens. That happens, okay? In, in a lot of diseases, there is already the last stage. That is the ultimate antibiotic. No more, nothing more. All right? So you have to look at other alternatives then. So we don't want that to happen. Now, antibiotic resistance is very, very serious. And antibiotic resistance now is being introduced into the, um, one of the criteria for probiotics. Probiotics are actually um, beneficial bacteria that enhance our health, the host health. So if you drink Yakult, for example, Yakult have this strain of bacteria called Lactobacilli casei shirota, shirota strain. Now, that is a very well-known probiotic because that shirota bacteria strain has been well-researched, has been well-documented. If you Google or search on journals, you can find the evidence that they have various benefits to the host. Now, imagine we're eating all these bacteria. And at the same time, Sometimes when we are sick, we are consuming antibiotics. And what if these bacteria harbor all this antibiotic resistance? They have the genes already to resist the antibiotic. And worse, they transfer this gene to other bacteria in the gut. So every, not every, a lot of bacteria in the gut, imagine, will have antibiotic resistance already. Now that can happen, which is why right now, one of the main criteria for a probiotic to be marketed to the consumer prior to marketing to the consumer, prior to approval. One of the criteria for approval is that it is not antibiotic resistant. It, do not, it does not have the trait of antibiotic resistance. So antibiotic resistance right now is a huge topic for debate, all right? Oh, okay. So what are the possible complications? Illness and treatment. You continue to get ill and there's no treatment because you've reached the end of the antibiotic line already. Okay, so this is the antibiotic. So if those bacteria will not be killed by antibiotics, we will continue to be ill, and worse, the illness will get worse. Okay, will we'll get worse. Okay, now that is inside the gut. Then I want to talk to you about the possibility, uh, a worse possibility, of a bacteria translocating to other organs. Now, imagine our gut, healthy gut being very well-defined, with barriers, and so on. So bacteria will remain in the gut. Bacteria, theoretically, should remain in the gut. Gut bacteria should stay where they are. But certain people, especially the um, immunocompromised ones, the ill ones, the sick ones, sometimes the gut barrier is tampered, which means that there will be a hole, a small, tiny hole in the gut. Now, this small, tiny hole would mean that some of these bacteria can get out from the gut, yeah, intestinal mucosa membrane, can, these are the holes. It can, can get out from the, blood, uh, from the gut and enter our blood circulation system. Now what happens when it enters our blood circulation system? It will go to uh, organs, infections. Now we've done animal trials on this. We have found that if the gut intestines have been altered, we can find a lot of um, microorganisms. Most of the time, we would use E. coli as a target, all right? Because most of us will have E. coli, and most of the animals will have E. coli as well. So if we take E. coli as a target, it'd be easier to see. Healthy animals, when we isolated their kidneys, isolate their spleen, isolate their livers, clear, it shouldn't have any E. coli. But those with intestinal barrier already altered, Sometimes we can see E. coli being detected from the other organs such as spleen, liver, kidney. So that means that this intestinal barrier has been altered. Microorganism has already escaped from the gut and has already caused infections or translocated to other organs. Now, most of the time they cannot survive in all these organs and they will die. But we are also very worried. How, what if, for example, that E. coli has that certain transgene uh, incorporated into themselves. And they bring that transgene going around to the organs. 
Then what will happen to the host? We are the host. So what will happen to us? No one knows yet. So we are talking about bacteria translocation. So movement of bacteria from one segment to the other, most of the time from the intestines to the organs. Okay? Now if this pathogen has these antibody resistant genes, then obviously it would make um, the pathogen stronger against antibiotic treatment. And if they transfer certain genes to the host, we do not know what are the consequences. Now let's look at one of these interesting studies. Later I'll give you the, uh, the information, then you, I hope that you read on it. Now whatever information that I put on e-learn, whatever information that I put on here, do read. Uh, as I've mentioned before, it's important. You must read, not just my slides. My slides actually have not much meaning. What are uh, important is you, uh, will be for you to read on your own to acquire that knowledge. All right? Now, okay, this University of uh, Newcastle, what is it that they have done? They want to see the, um, they want to evaluate on antibiotic resistant genes, whether could it be transferred to the host or not. Host will be us, the gut. So they have volunteers and these volunteers voluntarily consume GM food. What is it? GM soya. Now this GM soya has roughly 3,000 billion copies of transgene. And this transgene um, codes for resistance for various types of things. One of it is herbicide resistance from um, cauliflower mosaic virus, okay, from the virus, from the herbicide glyphosate, and, and all of that. So this transgene is originally of bacterial or origin, but uh, has been remodified into plants so that that's why they're eating that soya and they are acting as volunteers for this study. Now let's look at what they have found in this study. So they collect stool samples every 30 minutes up to six hours after eating from the volunteers and they evaluate from the stool samples. So what did they find in the stool samples? Very interesting. Uh, of course, the samples were evaluated for the presence of the specific gene that they're looking for. They know what gene it is because they know from the transgenic soya what gene has been added in and they try to track that gene in the stool. So what happened is that a relatively large portion of the genetically modified DNA can actually be recovered from the stool of the, uh, stool of the uh, sample, uh, volunteers and ultimately lead them to uh, conclude that throughout the intestine, they actually pass through 3.7% of the genetically modified DNA. Now, when we consume all these um, genetically modified crops or transgene material, the first assumption is that it goes through stomach, we'll digest that, and most of the time, the trans hopefully that the transgene will be uh, completely denatured or inactivated by our stomach. But that showed by this study, that did not happen. So from stool samples, we can already see the genetic material. So obviously, whatever that passed through our intestine will have been in contact with the genetically modified material as well. And if it has been in contact throughout our intestines, it will have also been in contact with our intestinal microorganisms. So see how serious this is. It's not just to the host, but also to our reservoir of microorganisms. And will there be a possibility of horizontal gene transfer? I would say yes, there is such a possibility. So I hope that will answer your question. Now, I want you to read on this. This is the title of the, um, the paper. So Google this title, and the uh, first author is Netherwood. So it's the world's first known trial on GM foods on humans. So read on this, published back in 2004, okay? Okay, then we have outcrossing. Now, outcrossing is uh, another concern, I hope you can Differentiate all these concerns similarly as how you could differentiate um, the applications of enzymes. What are the applications of enzymes in food bioprocessing? What are the applications of uh, plant tissue culture for food bioprocessing? And now what are the concerns of GM um, materials or foods? So one of it is the allergy, one, the second one is the gene transfer. As you can see, they are all very different. And now finally, outcrossing. Now outcrossing is a concern that happens um, when we are planting all these genetically modified materials in an open area. So let's see what happens. Now, outcrossing means movement of genes from the transgenic plant to a non-transgenic plant. Now, the non-transgenic plant can be a normal plant that we are planting, meant for agriculture, or a plant that is growing in the wild, 
that we do not plant, but they grow naturally. So all these kind of uh, uh, transfer can happen. So it also <laughs> refers to mixing of crops uh, derived from conventional ye uh, seeds then uh, with those using GM crops. So indirectly affect food security because we don't want um, conventional planted crops that are sold as non-GM later on when they are checking for quality con control, quality assurance, they find GM material. Then which means the entire batch goes down the drain. All right? So traces of type GM corn uh, approved for leaf, uh, livestock feed have been tracked, have been traced in a human consumption in the US. So contamination occurred. Now, does it mean that now with all these genetically modified uh, modification going on, Contamination is zero. No, not necessarily. So sometimes even food that are claimed to be non-GM can contain certain traces of GM. Now let's look at uh, the, um, the chronology of this. Now most of the GM plants are grown in six countries. You can see all these uh, statistics. And in uh, EU, look at the labeling. EU is very stern on all this genetically modified um, stuff. Some certain EU countries have zero tolerance, meaning they do not want genetically modified foods or crops or whatever that they're consuming. But that does not mean it's completely zero. For the EU labeling, if it's lower than 0.9%, then it can be claimed as non-GM. So which means that we still allow um, a certain level of contamination, which we may foresee as inevitable, but not too high. 0.9% is acceptable for the EU, for example. So why is it still that contamination could occur when we're taking so much uh, precaution? Well, we can take all the precaution, but from the moment the plants are harvested uh, till the, the whole process to the delivery of the consumer, there are a lot of chances of contamination. And along the line, look at it, during seed production, cultivation, harvest, transport, processing, all these throughout the whole line, contamination can occur. So which is why we could accept a certain level of contamination, very low, to accommodate throughout the whole processing line, OK? Now, coexistence of GM crops with um, conventional crops can also exist. But some countries have begun to use techniques to separate these crops. What happens is that they can have the GM crop in maybe this part of the state, maybe in Penang, separate out to north and south. The north part will be for GM crops, the south part may be for non-GM crops. Okay, some countries have done that. So they have done uh, buffer zone, cropping intervals. Now, uh, buffer zones and crop, cropping <coughs> intervals. Buffer zone meaning we have a zone for GM foods, then there is a buffer zone. This zone is not meant for anything, not agriculture or, or something. And this zone may be, let's say, 100 kilometers or depending on the, uh, on the um, requirement. Then after the buffer zone, then you have conventional crops. So there's a buffer zone to separate the GM crops and the conventional crops. Then there's also cropping intervals. So GM foods are being planted in one area. Then after that, they are harvested. Then they are left empty uh, for a period of time. And then other conventional crops come in after that harvested, left for a period of time again, then comes back the GM foods. So cropping, uh, harvesting intervals. Uh, OK, now I've talked about insects and wind. Later I'll talk more about that. Now, this is interesting. I want you to read on this study too. The uh, first author is Funk, uh, published back in 2006. This is the, t uh, this is the uh, title. And this is the title of the journal, the name of the journal. So I want you to search for this paper and read. Now what they do is that they did an experiment of uh, two, two years, for two years. They want to see what happens to um, outcrossing of genetically modified plants for plants that are genetically modified but at a different percentage. So they have um, plots with different ratios of transgenic plants. So we have plants that are planted 100%. Uh, this is transgenic for herbicide resistance. Then there's also another plot which only contains 1% of the transgenic plant, and another plot which contains only 0.1% of the transgenic plant. 
So what happens to the flow of the transgene? What happens to the outcrossing of the transgene? So obviously, it's pretty much expected. The more plants you have, the more transgenic plants you have, the higher is the gene flow. The lower percentage of transgenic plant you have, the lower is the gene flow. So that's pretty much expected. So average gene flow was that if you have 100% of transgenic plant, you have an average gene flow of 0.28%. So if you have lower uh, transgenic plant, only 1%, so it's, it has dropped to 0.01%. And if it's 0.1% transgenic, it's dropped to even further, 0.0065% of gene transfer. All right? Then what they found interesting, which is why I want you to read on this paper, is that how would all these flow of genes occur? And they found it's because of the insects. The honeybee, the bumblebee, it plays a role in transferring all these transgenes. Now, as they separate the um, GM crops to the non-GM crops, the further they separate, they find that the, uh, the, the, the lower flow of gene transfer. That is almost acceptable too. Of course, if it's nearer to the transgene crop, obviously you will have a higher flow of genes. Further off, further. So what they found is that for a distance is, uh, of a 2,500 meter or 2.5 meter, you can, uh, kilometer, you can have a 0.08% of gene flow, which is pretty low, as we have seen from the previous statistics. Now, this is because of Poland, Poland-mediated gene transfer. So all these insects, especially bees, they're very attracted to all the pollens and all that. And they would transfer all these pollens somewhere else. And during transfer, they can also transfer some of the transgene along. So insects and wind, they found to be responsible for this. And in the experiment, what is interesting is that they removed the petals from the plants. As we know, the bees and the insects, they are very much attracted to the flowers and the petals. If we remove the petals, what happened? Removing the petals makes them less attractive to the bees. Less attractive to the bees means less pollination. Less pollination means less transfer of the gene. So obviously, it shows here, first, of course, in this study, the further the distance, uh, the better it is for gene transfer, I mean, lower percentage. And if you have a lower percentage of transgene crop, it also has a lower percentage of transgene. And if you take wind and uh, all these insects into consideration, they are actually one of the main culprit too, to transfer all these genes. So this is an interesting study that I want you to read on, okay? Okay, that summarizes, uh, that, that ends my presentation today. But I've got two videos for you, and I want you to pay attention to two of these videos. I've been talking a lot about genetically modified foods using plants, <coughs> but I don't want you to get the idea of genetically modified materials or foods has to be from plants. It doesn't have to be from plants. It can come from any sources. It can come from microorganisms. It can come from um, a mammalian cell culture too. Now, one example of, com of uh, coming from microorganisms is the production of uh, certain enzymes. We have, learned, we have talked about enzymes, all right, in, in the past, past previous lectures. Now, what if we find that certain microorganisms can produce enzyme, very good enzyme producer, but not that good and not that high yield. We want to increase that. Then we can have the uh, bacteria to be genetically modified. Once we have identified the genes, of course, maybe we can replicate the gene and insert a, a new set of genes inside. So they would have two sets of the same gene, which will enhance the production of the enzyme. So that is also a genetically, micro, uh, genetically modified microorganism. And if we were to consume the microorganism or the enzyme being produced by the microorganism, we are taking it from the source of genetically modified sources. All right? Now, for mammalian cells uh, or mammalian source, I'm going to show you a video on uh, what happens using mammalian sources for genetically modified purposes. All right?
offsprings, subsequent offsprings of the chickens are now transgenic chickens and when they are laying eggs, they can produce that protein for vaccine development uh, with the target, with the aim, to produce vaccine at a cheaper price. Well, that's the scientific point of view. Then there's also the consumer point of view, the animal rights, point, animal rights, animal aid, that talks about animal rights, a point of view, that they are invasive, that they may be torturing the, the animals and so on. Now, after we are done...